I'm an information security consultant at Rendition InfoSec, and I'm also a signal officer in Army Reserve, and uh, that's my Twitter. And uh, just a warning, I, you know, being in Rocky City, I always like to throw Dr. Evil in there, so you'll probably see him a lot throughout the slide, so next slide. All right, so today we're talking about sharks with freaking lasers. No, kidding. But, um, but today we'll be talking about APIs, using Google APIs, and what you can see attackers out there, what they're using, and different ways where you can take something that's practically out there, really for everyone to use, and think outside of the box and use it for something different. So we'll be talking about some of the APIs out there, some exfil methods, and some different things out there that's available today that anyone can use. We'll do a demo real quick. We'll see how that goes since the computer's over there and I'm over here, but uh, we'll see how that works. And then what else is out there to use other than Google APIs? Next slide. So a couple disclaimers. Uh, you know, what's presented today are my views and not that of any of my employers. Um, definitely not a lawyer, and I definitely have no legal advice for you, so you know, seek that elsewhere. And also the, um, the most important one for this talk is uh, I have not read the monstrosity of the terms of service of you know Google APIs and their products, you know Google Drive stuff like that. So you, but I'm pretty sure this probably is not in you know allowed in their terms of service. So you know use at your own risk. You know do things responsibly, use things the right, correct way, et cetera, et cetera. But these are what people are actually doing out there. Next slide. And then the last disclaimer I got is uh, this is more of a post exploitation talk. So. It goes from the standpoint that you already have access to the machine, and I mean, you know, if you want to go down that road on, you know, how they get access to my machine, I mean, you know, just assume someone got fished or someone clicked the email or download attachments like people do. So I mean, you know, you can assume that. Next slide. All right. So for those that don't know APIs, you know, they're out there. They're web applications out there and software that's not on the web, but. The things that are out there a lot and increasingly today are APIs for web applications, and they are growing. You know, some people there are some free ones out there that people can use that you know throw up there to do something as simple as you know downloading lists of titles of movies from IMDb, some simple things like that. But some APIs give you access to actually write to them and you know post things to them. So they're out there. You, you don't need to know a lot about the back end of how things work. They just make it easier for other people to use it. Next slide. And also, go back one. Uh, and also, it's not only for web-based systems. You can do them for database systems. You can have it for something that's not on the internet. You can make your own local API. But they basically have four functions. Next slide. And there are way more functions than this. There's really five. But uh, the one I most think, you know, Utilizing this talk is the post method, and uh, I mean, basically, it's like the CRUD that you know you learn in school about create, read, update, and delete. So, posting is basically sending information from you know one system to another one using the API, including the data to it. Getting you basically going out getting something like it sounds. Putting basically updating you can update or replace, or update and modify, and delete, which you know. Delete in every language. Uh, next slide. So, different data exfiltration methods. Now, disclaimer: there are more out there, but here's a couple normal examples you'll see in a lot of breaches, things like that. You got email, FTP, IRC, SSH. So, as an exfiltration method, they all have some advantages and disadvantages. So. An advantage of using protocols like that for exfiltration is it's pretty easy to use. You can Google the command, you know, place a file and SCP something from one server to another server. The downside and disadvantage to doing that is because as a defender on a network, you can look at logs and see exactly where, you know, one file went to another file. And if you're using things like FTP or IRC, if you're not using the correct port, it's unencrypted, so a defender can actually see exactly what you're sending from one spot to the next spot. So if you're trying to, you know, get a certain, I don't know, credit card database from, you know, one organization to your server back at home, you can see all the credit card numbers and socials and everything in actual traffic if you're looking for it. 
And then you can, it has the actual web address and website or IP address to your server. So you can't say you didn't do it because it's right there in logs, easily available to it. A lot of people monitor those in, in a lot of different organizations. You don't even have access to the protocols out the firewall anyway. So that's the benefit and the disadvantage. Next slide. Another one that's used a lot today are VPSs, virtual private servers. You got you know, AWS, DigitalOcean, Google Cloud Platform. They are out there. Price is going down, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to use them. So they are very much out there. Advantage, they're out there, and they're freely used. And you can customize it to do whatever it is you want it to do. So let's say you're attacking ICS one day. ICS uses certain ports. So if you have your own server, you can configure it to actually transfer data on those ports, whereas something like FTP and SSH have specified ports that probably common in IT or general business applications for different companies. But if I'm doing something ICS and I need you know, Modbus or a certain port on a normal system, I probably don't have that flexibility to make those changes. But on something where I control the entire operating system, I can use any port I want. Disadvantage, that is easy to detect as well. And you still have the problem of, depending on protocols you use, it being unencrypted and they can see the actual data. And it has the location. So even though it's not your house, you're still tied to that platform in some sort of way or fashion, whether it is you're connecting from your house to that VPS, it has a log of that. You know, DigitalOcean, AWS, they keep logs as well, so they probably have to know, you know what IPs connect to the server as well. So you still have this layer that still attributes to you in some sort of fashion. There's some cost to it. Most VPSs are not free. So there's some setup as well. You got to set things up. It being customizable, you got to do work to actually get it to work. And it requires a little more knowledge of the you know, platform, because they all don't work the same. You know, whereas computers, you press the power button, it boots up. You, know, you got some general things. Some things like you know, Google, Google Cloud Platform, you actually have to like, download SSH keys and SSH to the machine, DigitalOcean, you have this little console button where you can press, a console pops up. But they all don't work the same. So you have to actually be familiar with the platform you're utilizing. Next slide. Now this one I've seen quite a bit this past year. When an organization might get hacked and they want to take their data, what they'll do is instead of using you know, something special, they'll just, you know, if they have a, a GUI, download Dropbox, log into their own you know, Gmail or actual account, and just point it to whatever folder they want to sync, whether it's the whole C drive or if it's a specified you know, folder with all the good information, credits and reports and everything. That's a better method. Why? Because on the, tra on the traffic, it shows you know, Dropbox or Google Drive, they're using Google Drive. It actually points it back to another company's server. Now, that's better than the first two methods I mentioned because it doesn't point you directly. You got to go through a vendor in order to get information on you know, who did what. Most file syncing applications now, not how it used to be, but now, you do utilize a secured method. So you won't have a full picture of what's being sent out of your organization by using these programs. But there is a disadvantage. It's pretty easy to detect because, like I said, they're making calls out to Dropbox. And most of the time, depending on the program you're using, they don't use a 443. They might use their own port securely. So Google Drive, for example, on a Mac, is a special port that it sends every, you know, it's encrypted data out on, whereas on Windows, it might be 443. So one in a recent breach that I was involved in was uh, they utilized Yandex, which is like, you know, international version of Dropbox that everyone likes to use. And one of the big disadvantage of using programs like this to data is because the programs, 
create logs and a lot of logs on the system, not on the network, although they, you see that you know, constant traffic, but it actually saves a lot of information about the applications used on the machine. So for that, that incident I was referring to earlier was we actually look at Yandex, they have a log file. It actually shows you what account they used to log into it, you know, what files they wanted to sync, what directory they pointed at it, when it was used, what time it was used, what files it synced, when it synced, when it wasn't syncing, what was it doing. It leaves a huge forensic standpoint of a footprint on the machine. And let's say they, you know, get their data out, they sync it. They delete those files, it's still there on disk. You can grab it from an allocated space. So, I mean, it uses a large footprint, but it is, you know, secure on the network to where you don't see actually what data is sending out, but it's saving it somewhere else where you can actually see that. So that's a better method, but still not good enough. But one of the things that we mentioned before in API is used for software as well. So a lot of these services and programs utilize an API to actually run the program. It's nothing but an API being called on your machine. In that, mach in that system, one of the API calls is making a log. So it's sending a log on your machine and it's sending a log where it's sending it to. So if you go to the next slide, one of the way that people are getting smart and, and looking outside of the box is interacting with that same API directly. So a lot of times, the part of the program that's calling that API and creating logs, why don't we just call the API to do the transfer and don't save any logs? So now you don't have to worry about that footprint of logs being saved about what account you're doing, you know, what you're syncing. There's no record of that because you're not saving it since you're calling the API directly. Advantages, it's still secure using the same thing, the basic requests. It looks like normal traffic because you're utilizing their API and sending things back to their server. It's a whitelisted domain. It's not, you know, evillabs.net or something where something that you own and you're attributed to, it's something that another company is doing. And then if you utilize a lot of APIs, they're free and open source. So, you know, it's no cost. You can just use the API and everything just works. Disadvantage, it does take some customization, you know, everything, whereas like Dropbox, you know, you have to go through that setup prompt to say what folders you want to sync, what, you know, where do you want to send it, who you, you know, who you are, authenticate. It has some customization that you have to set up per environment. Now that can be easy as, you know, let's say you want, I don't know, all the PDFs in an organization. You're going to have to manually put in a filter to say look through the system, grab all the PDFs and send it to whatever service API you're using. And then it takes a little knowledge of the API you want to use. So if it's Dropbox, you got to know how Dropbox utilizes their APIs. You have to craft it however they want you to do it. And that's not that bad because nine times out of 10, if there's a public API out there, you utilize it directly and there's documentation and examples of how to use them. So it's not that bad but it does take a little bit of work to actually get it going. Now, next slide. So, th those are just a lot of the main different things I'm seeing out there and different ways of, you know, interacting with APIs. But Google, Dropbox, you know, there are APIs out there, but there are so many more. And in practice, it can be applied to anything that lets you write to it. So, next slide. So, I'm gonna show you a couple traffic captures, and by a show of hands, would you block this traffic? Anybody. So I don't know if you can read it, but uh, the first bit here is a DNS query to mail.google.com, and then they basically do their encryption handshake, and then they start sending data. Would anyone block this traffic? Depending on the state you live in. Depending on the state you live in, good, good point. That's a good question. What is in the data? If you right click and follow stream, it would be nothing but the cert because it's encrypted, it's TLS. So you would just basically get a block. So, so no one in this room would block this traffic, right? No? All right, so this is basically just a, P, a 
packet capture of going to mail.google.com and signing in. Nothing malicious was done in this case. I'll mention later on there is a Google Mail API that we can utilize down the road. But just by looking at this, you have to make a judgment in your environment. Do you block it or do you not? Now, you don't have a lot of information to make that call. But from a business operation standpoint, probably wouldn't block this traffic. Maybe, no? It might be that phishing email. A lot of companies block Gmail. So interesting, interesting point. I was uh, involved in a breach of a healthcare organization. They got breached. Then they blocked Gmail. They blocked Google, the entire domain. You can imagine how their employees react to that. There was a huge uptick the BYO, BYOD. So we started seeing, you know, after the breach already occurred, surfaces, mobile hotspots, SSID counts went way up. So I mean. If someone doesn't know something, what's the first thing you do? You go Google it. So I mean, if you're blocking the domain itself, you're in some pretty big trouble. You're probably going to get you know, a few calls saying Google's not working anymore in your environment. Next slide. So here's another one. DNS query to drive.google.com. Now this one is a little more you know, suspicious, but not really, because who here doesn't use Google Drive at all? I'm sure there's probably a few, but you probably use something. And it probably has an API in the back end that you probably can do the same thing. So just substitute Google for, you know, insert company here, whether it's Microsoft or, you know, Yandex or, you know, whatever you want to use. But here it's just basically going to drive.google.com in the browser, whereas you already logged in. So nothing much is here, although it could be. Drive has an API as well. You can actually data as well. The point is, it's encrypted traffic, so again, you can't really see it unless you, know, you have a certificate installed and you're decrypting your traffic, which is the point you'll see later on. One more slide. So here's one with Sheets. Now, who here has used Google Sheets before? Do you know that there is a Sheets API where you can utilize Google Sheets for traffic as well? You can actually send data to Google Sheets. And again, from the, from the network level as a defender, if you see this, you know, the only mention of Sheets involved is that DNS query. And that DNS query, there's a C name, a common name right next to it. This is Google APIs.google.l.google.com. So if you go to the next slide, if you resolve that IP of what that traffic's going to, it's just Google APIs. It has no mention of Sheets. So unless you're looking at DNS, you're not going to know what Google API is being called here. And the, you know, as you can see this wall, traffic's encrypted. So you don't know what's leaving. Now, again, going, the point was to show, if you go to google.com, check your email, whatnot, on the browser, you just see your email. Under the hood, though, they're utilizing a lot of APIs. And that's what's going to reflect in your traffic. So you don't know if you're just browsing or if data is leaving your company. And that's sort of the point. Next slide. So I did a check yesterday, actually. And I looked at all of Google's publicly available APIs. Does anyone have a guess on how many they have publicly available? 10 more? More than 50? More than 75? More than 100? Next slide. So when we did a count on this, there was 114 publicly available APIs. Now, I'm pretty sure there's private APIs as well out there as well. But 114 APIs that can be utilized. And it's probably being utilized out there. Next slide. So the one that I started playing with the most and was intriguing to me the most was Google Sheets. So Google Sheets API, like I mentioned before, is very user friendly. There's a lot of languages that it, you know you can utilize it. You know Python, .NET for you know some Windows devices. Python's pretty cross platform as well. So you can custom make API calls with any of these languages. Google Sheets API, it's free. 
There's no cost to use it. And Google Sheets is basically, if you haven't used it, basically like a web version of Excel. So it's basically a big database. So if you have your own database one place, I can basically copy the database and just throw it, throw it in a Sheets file. There's loads of support languages, like I mentioned. And then a lot of things that Google likes to do, they like to make everything easy to use and easy to use other Google services. So there are things like BigQuery, where you can do like machine learning and sending large amounts of data from Google Sheets to Google's BigQuery database. And it's pretty easy, like the press of a button, you just points to the Sheets name and press enter, and it just sent it all the BigQuery in the background. It's just magic. So limited storage, if you've used Google Drive before, if you send the file to Google Drive, that counts against your storage. If you use their things, like Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Sheets, there's no limit. It doesn't go against your limit. So I can send as much data as I want to to this Google Sheet. And if the Sheets fills up, I just open up another one. It doesn't count against my storage. Why not? And again, it's free. Next slide. All right, so this is the interesting part. Uh, demo. Thank you. 
character file. So while this is a 50,000 character, it doesn't keep any in context, you know, returns, return record, and all that as well. So if you're not utilizing decrypting your SSL traffic using, you know, some sort of proxy in your environment, you're missing out. Because with that, you can see more information and your DLP solution might actually work since you can see the traffic. Or Google can tell on you. Next slide. So when you decrypt the traffic or put a proxy between, you can actually see the post and actual information is sending. Before, you just saw the TLS traffic and you didn't really see anything. Next slide. So, some people actually decrypt their organization traffic, but by doing so, it runs some liability by doing so because, you know, you're on lunch break and you're browsing for, you know, checking your bank account. Now they can actually see what you log into your bank account, depending on most banks, if they have a HSTS or not. So they can actually see your credentials, and if they're decrypting that traffic and storing it somewhere, if they get hacked later on, now they're responsible for losing your bank information. So, I mean, there's some issues by doing that. Next slide. So here are the major APIs that I saw were interesting that you can write. You got Gmail, you got Drive, you got Sheets, you got Slides. I can send the same file to a Google Slide and it'll look the same. Uh, you can store large amounts of data in cloud storage. The first one's not free, but the rest are free. And there's the API to, to look and get more details on APIs, believe it or not. Next slide. So who else? Again, Google's not the one out there. Dropbox has a core API that, you know, you can utilize a lot of the same things. It's out there, it's available to be used. A lot of people aren't thinking about it in that way because that's not what they're intended to do, but it's available out there. Next slide. Any questions? One minute to spare. If not, thank you.